Elegant Sea Urchin is a serial oral fiction written, presented, and produced by Swoon as part of the Greater Swoon Craft Creative. You can support this and all things Swoon by subbing, sharing, becoming a patron, or making a one-time donation. And before the program starts, our oracle had this to say. Take a number, stand in line, divide by zero, jump to the left, and look beyond the smog. If you see it, relax. There's nothing to be done about it. <laughs> you, listening, thanks, and enjoy. Down the steep flies KV, it's Mesa's ditcher, it seems Cove's bellhop fed, clueless, and uh, he, does he, he does, he answers the door, another sand dollar for the visiting team, and if the Cove doesn't get out of the murk, they'll be on ice. What do you think, Ald? Uh, You're absolutely right, I think our team's best chance is on offense, but Ald offensive teams rarely take championships. Uh, it is unorthodox, but we've seen wilder games from the home team, and speaking of, our flasher just stunned Mesa's gargoyle. Without their pivotal defender to tip the bellhop, Mesa, there it is! When was the last time you've seen all three anemics on a team charged to bleed together? The crowd is losing their minds, unable to break into chorus as the runes react. Do you hear it all? Two bells sprang, and the thresholds are open. The cove's flasher is banished. A starfish! The cove takes the starfish! The championship game is over! After the trials of nearly losing the playoffs, the cove adapts to overcome our weakened defense. Dreadful acolytes and idolaters of the fractured magenta dimension, I haven't seen a game won by starfish all year! Now the field would be buzzing, and there they go. The Mesa don't believe it, and it's turning into a veritable maelstrom down on the field. The crowd is thrilled for more blood. Here's the chanting, but wait! The faculty is trying to ebb the tide of blood and are you courteously saying please? They're putting that on display. He didn't secure our central threshold once during the match. Uh. That's right, all. Mesa scored five sand dollars off his portal alone. The true pedestal belongs to our flasher, Cena. If she hadn't put herself out there, we wouldn't have stood a chance. Not only keeping up in sand dollars, but striving for that last push and getting the anemics the chance they needed for a chance at a starfish. Ho hold on. Y yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Loathsome listeners, I'm being told by a woman of the tendrils that our time for broadcasting is up. Thank you for this opportunity, UV Wavecast Incorporated. Thank you to the sponsors, Thermal Pens and the Cove Critter Control. This probably would have been possible without your money, but the adults thank you all the same. Um. And I'm Fable Knox. To all my regular listeners, I'll be back shortly on my usual humble ripple. Everyone else, thanks for catching our waves. Maybe you'll hear us again in the future. With some listeners, that was amazing. I wasn't expecting to to be that fluid at announcing. I mean, I have been practicing for a couple of years, and the the past week, all your feedback from my wavecasted practice has helped tremendously. But but the cove won, and that's more important. During the trophy ceremony, I saw a man talking to Cena, our pivotal player, the the dreadful, dark, and handsome type that we assume to work directly under him. You know, there's fond tales of families being elevated by them. One family a century, we say. In my family, it was Null Voice Knox, my grand eighth great father. His nullship was created for his creation of eight-legged catnip. It's been around for nearly a millennia, so I won't go into the details. Interestingly though, looking through his journals as a girl, I always found it strange that this nip stuff was all but forgotten about at the glowing dawn. It made life maybe a little too free of fear since the cat's infestation was controlled. I wouldn't know except by things I've read, of course, but there's enough to suggest in books like The Metropolis and Reading Between the Lines that the big fears of our great-grandfamily's times were no bigger than our current fears. The peppercorns haven't been in the cycle recently, and there's a new concern that the smog's tempo is going to be changing soon from lack of pollution. Hmm. Why were the rail systems removed if there was a projected concern of the smogs to be altered? Why do we let strange societies like the peppercorns go about tinkering and thinking in such strange ways? Well, those are questions Uncle L has proposed since being assigned. I... <clears throat> Wavecatchers, I think I 
broke something in Uncle K. I can still hear his last words to me, that something, something, had something changed. has changed. My own concerns are much more subdued. I think I'm gaining an appetite from all the activity recently. I'm afraid to wave cast after end school. I, I, I want to do something good, but I can't help feeling like I'll fail or that I can't do it alone. And while talking about loneliness, I need to bring Sina up. You see, though, uh, wave catchers. After the game, I went back to the lockers to congratulate Sina. She's one of the three girls on the team, so her and the two anemics from our team were in the lockers, and like usual, it was filled with the cheer troop. Aya, unfortunately, included. Aya had a wave -o to her ear and was scarlet-faced, but I didn't care. I let Heather's hand go and greeted Sina. Heather was with me through the championship wave cast and of course came with me to the lockers. I figured a good next step was to get a few interviews, try to be a proper wave caster. And as I asked if she consented to an interview, she laughed. <laughs> you don't ask for consent before talking about stuff in your wave cast. Why is this different? Before I could reply, Aya stormed up to her. Why are you acting like I didn't do an eldritch thing? And loathsome? Really? I glanced up to her, her auburn hair slick and scattered against her unclothed body of marble. Heather audibly sucked in. Cena groaned, turning back to her locker. Aya's dimples were far below her cleft chin, and she pressed. Don't you turn away. You're part of the problem, Flasher. I still didn't know what Aya was rippling about, but when I finally opened my mouth to ask, she continued, Sina, what do you know about magenta fractals? This filled something deep within Sina. This girl I've always admired for her calm, calculated plays on the doorball field whipped around with such rage her raven hair whipped against my shoulder. Don't you dare bring my pop's research up. I, uh, <laughs> I think it's safe to say that Sina's dad does some secret research on the fractured magenta dimension. But what did this have to do with anything? Well, I uh, began to fill that answer, explaining, It's because of you that Faye nearly died. That Faye's a reply, which I cut off, blurting out, What? To Fable, don't listen to her. I barely know what my pop does for work, let alone any details or conclusions to do anything about fractals. I looked at her and could only see her great play that made us champion. I told Aya, even if her pop did do research, how would she and Aya cut me off? Just like you and your great father's work on Nip! I wondered where along the line of my life she could have known that. I've never taken his journals from my family's hollow. One of my reports? I, I never dove that far in. I don't talk to people much either. And I, I stuttered. How? It doesn't matter how, Cena replied, her voice laced with toxins. She's got Papa Tentacle on her side. And then Cena left. Me and Heather left. Whatever else Aya had to say, she couldn't chase us because she was still nude and I wasn't paying attention. Because it was true what Cena had said. And I was pretty frustrated that I didn't get an interview.